All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, thank you for a great weekend and for the rest. Uh, thank you for today, uh, this half day of work. Um, I pray that you bless our time in this class. Um, I pray for our picnic, um, that you give us a great time to connect and to have fun. Um, Father, you're the giver of all good things, and you have have given us so many good things, and you've yet to give us so many good things. I pray that you give us a glimpse of that uh, today, and we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. So, we are looking at John 6 today. So, what did you find interesting about the homework? Yes, tell me your name. Drew. Yeah, you read uh, Psalm 107, and it's almost like John was looking at Psalm 107 when he picks out the details. And we're going to see that that's important because the uh, connection there, the actor is God in uh, Psalm 107, and the actor in John 6 is Jesus. So, like, uh, is he using that to help us see that Jesus is God? That's uh, good. Who else? Uh, oh, I'm going to remember your name. Uh, Jer Elijah? Right, so there's a connection. John's the only one that says the miracle happened at Passover. He's the only one who tells us they were barley loaves. And those two details are the exact two details that are added by the uh, Elisha story. Um, uh, um, Second Kings 4 tells us that that miracle happened around Passover and that they were barley loaves. So it seems that John is really trying to get us to see that the Jesus miracle is a recapitulation of the uh, Elisha miracle. Good. Uh, who else found something interesting in the reading? Uh, Ryan. So I wanted to, in the John 6 passage, when Jesus talks about how you have to eat of his flesh. Or and, and not just eat. I mean, the word tragon is like munch, like chow down, you know, on Jesus' flesh. So the text doesn't say that, but as a intelligent reader, that's kind of what you walk away with. That uh, when crowds of people start following Jesus, he always does something to thin the crowd out. So Sermon on the Mount, he goes to the top of the mountain. The people have to follow him, and here everybody wants this food, and he is almost intentionally doing things to push people away. Um, I mean, Jesus could get 25,000 people, but he knows that a lot of people are there just kind of mercenary, you know, you give me something and I'll come follow you. And uh, Jesus isn't into that. Um, Jesus wants people... Uh, who are going to turn from their sins and, and believe. And so it is interesting that it it seems like, or it seems like a fair conclusion that he's saying these hard sayings to, uh, to have people turn back, uh, which is interesting. What else do you find interesting about the homework? All right, well, uh, let's dive in then. So these are the points I, w I wanted to make today. Uh, one is there's a connection between Jesus and Elisha. Just as John the Baptist is kind of the new Elijah, dressed in camel hair, leather belt around his uh, waist, 
uh, kind of speaking out the judgment of God, so too uh, a prophet of great grace is going to follow, uh, that is, um, uh, Jesus is God incarnate. There's a connection between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 100 in 2 Kings 4. Um, I want to make a connection between Jesus walking on the water and Yahweh walking on the water. Um, I'm not sure if I put in my um, um, slideshow the Job 9 passage, I think I had you read Job 9, but in Job 9 it says, who alone tramples down the waves of the sea? And the answer is only God can do that. And Jesus is trampling down the waves of the sea. Uh, then I want to make a point that actually a Brian student helped me see, um, a Brian student that had learned uh, Hebrew here uh, in the a uh, Hebrew text of the Noah's Ark story, it says the ark walks on water. Um, and usually that's translated something like floats on water, but it is the word walk. And so you've got this salvific space walking on water in the Old Testament, and you wonder if salvific space uh, isn't walking on water in the New. And then we're going to look at eternal security and John 6, can a true believer uh, be saved and then end up in hell? What does John uh, 6 say about eternal security? Uh, and we're going to see that Jesus is talking about a number of people have been given to him, and it's God's will that he lose zero from that number. Um, and then we're going to look at this text in 644 of what it means for God to draw someone to themselves, the Greek word helkuo. So with God's help, let's uh, dive in. Um, in the Old Testament, uh, you've got the Elisha story in 2 Kings 4, 42 through 44. And look how many of those elements are repeated in John. Uh, you've got first fruit offerings, which is on the day after the Sabbath that follows Passover. And John uh, tells us that this happened near Passover. We've got the numbers are given. There are a hundred uh, men, uh, and uh, that's not counting the uh, uh, women and children. Um, Matthew and Mark both say we didn't count the women and children. Uh, John says... Uh, uh, counted the men, and many people would say, oh, that just shows the Bible's anti-woman. No, that's the Bible showing that this text was, says there were 100 men there. It's helping us see that Jesus, uh, Elisha takes 20 loaves and feeds 100 men. That is one loaf for every five people. Jesus, five men. Jesus takes five loaves and feeds a thousand. So uh, Jesus is not like Elijah. He's not even the super Elisha. He's in a whole different uh, category. Um, notice that uh, 2 Kings 4 tells us they're barley loaves. John tells us they're barley loaves. Notice 2 King has uh, Elisha telling his servant, you give them something to eat. And in uh, three of these uh, versions, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Uh, the disciples complain, how can I set a hundred loaves, bef uh, 20 loaves before these men? Uh, we only have five loaves. I put 10,000, it's actually $20,000, uh, would be 200 uh, denarii, uh, 200 days wa wages at $100 a a day, um, if we had $20,000, we couldn't feed all these people even just a little bit. Um, notice that in the Elisha story, nothing is said about them being satisfied, but in all four versions in the New Testament, it says they ate all that they wanted. And then we have uh, some fragments are left over and they're put in baskets. And notice 
that's uh, 2 Kings 4, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us that they put uh, the thing in baskets, and we're going to see why they put it in baskets uh, in a minute. Uh, I think some of these slides are out of order. I'm uh, sorry about that. I ran out of time. But what about this walking on water? Well, uh, this is a picture of something like the boat they were in. It's a little bitty boat. Um, the uh, Sea of Galilee is about um, 8 miles across and 12 miles long. If you want to put that perspective, if uh, Bryan College were here in Bethsaida, uh, then uh, Sale Creek would be about here. So if you drove in your car from here to Sale Creek, that's about how long it was. Uh, about eight miles uh, across. Um, and when we step back and look at all the versions of the story, uh, Jesus is on the mountain. He's done this miracle, but he's on the mountain and he's seeing that they're trying to row across the um, lake. And uh, Jesus comes in the early hours of the morning and he intended to pass them by. That's a very interesting statement. He saw them racked in pain. One of the accounts says he saw them being tortured, uh, tortured by the rowing. Now, what's interesting about this is who had commanded them to go across the lake? When we read all four accounts, it's Jesus that commanded them to go across the lake. And Jesus knew that as fishermen, they had gone across this lake probably since they were six years old. This was something they could do easily Jesus commands them to go across, and the wind is opposite, and Jesus leaves them out there. Uh, they get in the boat sometime before 5 o'clock. Uh, they're out there 6 to 9, the first watch. They're out 9 to 12, the second watch. They're out 12 to 3, the third watch, and sometime during the fourth watch of the night, perhaps as much as 15 hours uh, they've been uh, going, uh, trying to get to the other side, doing something that they were very good at, and Jesus is watching them. And it raises the questions, Is Jesus ever ask you to do something that it's physically impossible for you to do? Uh, does he ever give you a command that is beyond um, your strength to fulfill? Uh I vote yes that Jesus sometimes does that uh, to help us uh, not rely on our strength but on his strength. This is a replica of the boat they think actually um, uh, they sailed in. So imagine 12, 13 people in that little bitty boat. Uh, hurricane force winds. Uh, the, um, the Sea of Galilee is below sea level and it's... Uh, um, there are mountains all around it, so imagine that wind swirling around uh, that lake. Uh, they were in bad, bad shape. And in the fourth watch, that is sometime after 3 a.m., Jesus came to them walking on the water. Now, uh, when you put the numbers together uh, and try to make out the distances work, it, it, we're given a very specific place uh, that they were. Uh, this is where the miracle of 5,000 happened, and they're trying to get uh, there. We're going to see that John actually gives us how many feet or how many yards they were away. So this is a picture. Um, I, th I think this is on the Galilee side, so Jesus would have been up on one of those mountains, and he would be looking, and they would be in the middle trying to get uh, on this side. I think uh, Rembrandt may uh, have something here when he paints the story uh, something like this. So here's a question I have for you. Um, if Jesus commanded them to go across, who was it who was governing the storm that was preventing them from fulfilling that command? I mean, was it the devil uh, bringing that storm? Or does the Bible say of Jesus through whom all things exist? I mean, if all things exist through Jesus, do air mo molecules exist through Jesus? Does wind exist through Jesus? So 
this is really interesting. Uh, Jesus commanded them to go over, and Jesus was in co- control of the storm. Um, and uh, Colossians uh, 2.9 makes that point, don't ever let someone rob you by some slick argument. Everything that makes God who and what he is existed in Christ in bodily form. Jesus didn't stop being God because he incarnated. Uh, he Everything true of his divine nature was true of Jesus uh, incarnated and is still true of Jesus incarnated. In heaven, he's limited by a body, and at the same time, where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. Uh, Jesus can be hungry and at the same time be the uh, God, omnipotent God that feeds creation. Uh, Jesus can know all things, but in the unity of his person, he can experience ignorance because of his uh, human nature. Everything that makes God who and what he is existed in Christ in bodily form. And Wayne Grudem uh, says it this way, those who find the doctrine of the incarnation inconceivable have sometimes asked whether Jesus, when he was a baby in the manger at Bethlehem, was also, quote, upholding the universe. To this, the answer must also be yes. Jesus was not just potentially God or someone in whom God uniquely worked, but was truly and fully God with all the attributes of God. He was a Savior who is Christ the Lord, Uh, which means as he died helplessly on the cross, who was the person holding the molecules of of the nails together? It was Jesus as he was being cursed on the cross. Who was it who was giving breath to those who were cursing him? It was Jesus who was holding the molecules of the cross together. It was Jesus. So he's dying in utter helplessness, and at the same time, he's the one who's holding the molecules of the universe together. Notice what uh, what it says in John. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing when they had rowed about three or four miles. And in uh, the Greek text, I think it says 25 or 30 stades, and a state is 607 feet. I mean, he's giving you the precise, uh, I think that works out to like 2.7 to 3.3 miles. He's, he's telling you exactly where they were, and as a fisherman, he would know that. Uh, Mark says when the boat was in the middle of the sea, and when you put those numbers together, it plots it exactly uh, at the place I showed you on the map. Um, They saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. And then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was to the land where they were going. So for 15 hours, they had gone about 3.3 miles, and Jesus stepped into the boat, and all of a sudden the boat was in the harbor. It's almost like something uh, magical happened or miraculous. 15 hours, they go 3.3 miles. Jesus steps in the boat, and all of a sudden they're at the shore. Um, And is Jesus saying something about that to us, that uh, when Jesus asks us to do the impossible, maybe the reason we're struggling so hard is because Jesus isn't in the boat, and instead of working so hard, we need to start looking for Jesus to get in the boat, and when Jesus gets in the boat, we'll get where we're going. Of course, there's a connection between this story and Psalm 107.23. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters, That is, some people are fishermen, and fishermen go down to the waters. Um, He commanded and raised up a stormy wind, and this is Yahweh commanding, which lifted up the waves of the sea. Jesus is Yahweh. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. Can you imagine how they were at each other's throats after 15 hours thinking they were going to die in any minute? And don't you know somebody's screaming, you're not pulling your weight, you're, uh, you're rowing not hard enough, or you're doing this or that. And can you imagine what that was like? And they're at their wit's end. 
They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to YHWH in their trouble, and YHWH, Yahweh, delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed, and they were glad that the waters were, were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Can you see that John may be reading this psalm and saying, hey, that's exactly what happened uh, when we were in that boat? Uh, oh, here's the Job 9. It lists a whole bunch of things that only God can do. And it says, who alone stretched out the heavens, who alone trampled down the waves of the sea. Yahweh tramples down the waves of the sea. Jesus is trampling down the waves of the sea. I wonder who Jesus is. And John is helping us see that point. Uh, here's the text in John that uh, shows that this happened at Passover. Um, here's the text where, uh, like Elisha, uh, the disciples complained that how can we feed these people even if we had $20,000, everybody wouldn't get a little bit. There was much grass at the place. Uh, some People will say, oh, there's a contradiction. You know, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke say it was a deserted place or a desert place, and John says there were a lot of grass there. Well, uh, it's not a contradiction. Go look up the Greek word. The Greek word means deserted of people. Uh, and if you've ever been there, it's a place deserted <laughs> of people, even uh, to this day. But it's very green and grassy where this happened. Well, why the baskets? Why put this stuff in baskets? Now, if we were Jews, we would get this. But we're not Jews. For most of us aren't Jews. In the Old Testament, there was a special offering called first fruits. And first fruits was always offered on the day after the Sabbath that followed Passover. Uh, that is, the Sunday that followed Passover. On that day, you were to harvest the first thing that springs up out of the ground. And in uh, Israel, the first thing that springs up out of the ground uh, is the barley harvest. So you were uh, to um, offer that, and you were to take some of it, the first fruits of that uh, barley harvest. Uh, you were to uh, bake it into bread loaves, and then you were to put it in a basket and wave it before God on the Sunday that followed Passover. Passover can be any day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's connected to the first full moon after the spring equinox. But on the Sunday, whatever day this happens, on the Sunday, the first harvest that you get, you put that in a basket and then you wave it before the Lord. And this is what it says. You will take some of the first fruit of the ground, which uh, you harvest from your land uh, that the Lord your God is giving you. You will put it in a basket. You will go to the place the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time, and you shall say to him, I declare today that the Lord your God, uh, to the Lord your God, that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to the fathers to give us. And the text says, as soon as you say that, God says everything will all right will be all right between the two of us. You do that on the Sunday that follows Passover. Well, do you know anything else that happens in the Bible on the Sunday that follows Passover? Do you know somebody else who was called the first fruits of them who slept? It's like, oh my goodness, this is the day Jesus rose from the dead and it's like being predicted in the Old Testament not only when it's going to happen but the actual day of the week it's going to happen and you're to do this with uh, uh, baskets um, and so Jesus performs this miracle and then has all the leftover bread put in a basket well what are they going to do with it they're going to take it and say I've come into the land I've received the inheritance and what they've received is the person of Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm the fulfillment of this. That's why in this story, 
people uh, saw the sign that he had done, and they said, this is, indeed is the prophet. Uh, Moses promised that after him would come a prophet like me from among the people. And they're saying, that's who this guy is, the prophet who has come down into the world. Um, here's uh, the passage that says the ark floated on the surface of the water. And I think nearly every English translation um, goes with it that way. But this is the word um, in Hebrew, uh, vatelek. And if I said, show me how that word's translated everywhere in English translations, this is what comes up. And you can see it's the word walk. I mean, when you um, look at the other times it's translated float as I see it is never translated float uh, but somebody wanted to make it easy for us so they didn't translate it the ark walked on the water so they translated the ark floated on the water but when they translate it floated it makes it impossible for us if we read in English to connect this story with Jesus to which I say uh, shame on us as translators we should empower our people to make the beautiful biblical theological connections. Don't translate the way you think it should be translated. Translate exactly what it says. Uh, God knew what he was doing when he picked out the words, and he didn't pick out the word float. He picked out the word walk, and so we should translate it uh, walk. At least uh, th that's my, uh, maybe not humble enough, but... Uh, that's my opinion. Uh, we, we should translate the words that are there, not the words we should uh, think are there. Uh, the, the ark walked in the wa uh, ark walked upon the faces of the waters. Oh, that's an interesting uh, phrase because I remember that phrase, that exact phrase from uh, Genesis 1 2, and the ruach of God was hovering over the faces of the waters. And so, like, what the Spirit of God was doing at creation, the ark was doing in the Noah story, and now we have Jesus walking on the faces of, of the water as the presence of God, as a salvific space. And when Jesus gets in their boat, they get where they're going. I wonder if all those stories aren't uh, connected. And I do thank my student, Jackson Gravit, for pointing out that to me. I remember when he pointed out to me in Hebrew, I thought to myself, a nice try, Jackson, but I don't think that's what it really says until I went and actually read it in Hebrew, and he was right and I was wrong. So kudos for him for being a Berean and reading uh, the text and not listening to his uh, know-nothing teacher at that uh, point. Uh, so thank you to uh, Jackson for helping me see that. Notice that we have the I am statements uh, here. Uh, he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, what's uh, interesting about that statement, it is I, in Hebrew it's the word ego me. I am. So in, uh, in uh, sorry, in Greek it doesn't say it is I, it says ego me. And uh, ego is where we get the word ego from. Like uh, it's just the word I in Greek, and then the amy is the am part. So ego amy is I am. So Jesus says to them, ego amy. Now, what's interesting about that is that ego amy appears in the Old Testament when um, Moses says, "Look, you're." sending me to people, I don't even know what your name is. And God says, if you want to know uh, what my name is, you tell them, ego a me sent you. I am sent you. And so it, when you start putting Psalm 107, uh, Job 9, where it's only Yahweh who trembles down the waves of the water and where uh, Yahweh is stilling the storm, and then Jesus is saying, don't fear, ego, a me. He's massively hinting at the fact that this, this is Yahweh incarnate. 
I don't think they realized that till after Jesus rose from the dead, but uh, John tells us that they did sit around and would reminisce about the stories and then kind of put things together years later uh, saying, you remember what Jesus said? He said, I go in me and, and like I'm reading in the Old Testament and God says I am and like, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid, and he's trampling down, and it's like, oh, my goodness. There it was, and I didn't, uh, wasn't able to see it at the time. We've made the point already about Jesus in crowds. Uh, Truly I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Uh, Jesus isn't interested about people following him based on what they can get uh he he's um he's not interesting interested in uh doing that jesus says what's the work of god this is the work of god that you believe um you, you don't have to do crazy things you have to believe you have to believe uh the one whom god sent now In the time we have left, what about eternal security? Because when you start talking about eternal security, people are going to point out things like, well, you know, the text says Simon Magus uh, believed and he was actually baptized by uh, Peter. And then Peter says, may your uh, money go to hell with you. I mean, that's what he says in uh, Greek. uh, um, And... uh, he says, pray that this doesn't happen. Um, uh, Judas was baptized, and Jesus says it would be better uh, that a um, uh, person would never be born. Uh, Judas can't be in heaven, and yet he was baptized, and he may have even eaten the Lord's Supper. Um, you have uh, the people in Hebrews 6 who've tasted of the good things to come and then fall away and it's impossible to uh, redeem them and then you have uh, you know a writer like John Bunyan if you've ever read Pilgrim's Progress and one of the first things he sees that the spirit shows him is the man in the iron cage who has uh, sinned so much that uh, he can't repent anymore and he's alive but he knows he's headed to hell And so you read that and you say, well, does the Bible teach eternal security or not? Is uh, eternal security something made up by men or is it something actually that the Bible uh, teaches? And different denominations and people are going to say different things. I think the Greek text teaches eternal security, but it teaches eternal security to people who truly believe. If you've ever... Uh, been in a camp and um, you know somebody gave an altar call and and you have a child come down and the person says I can guarantee you right now that you're saved forever well Jesus never talked like that Um, Jesus never said if you walk down the the aisle I'll guarantee that you uh, will be in heaven what he did say is that if you truly believe, you're going to end up in heaven. Uh, uh, And this is how he says it. So I am not going to say it, uh, you know, if you pray the prayer I give you, then I can guarantee, because I don't know your heart. Only Jesus knows your heart. But I will say that the Bible does teach that if you have ever Um, truly turn from your sins and embrace Jesus as the only way that you'll be right with God. Uh, The Bible says that um, your your eternal destiny is secure. But let's look at the text and see if that's what the text says. Jesus says, "I've I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. And uh, if you have a preacher uh, or someone who knows Greek, go to him and ask him about what this text says in the Greek, because what it says in the Greek is 
the whole thing that the Father has given to me, I will raise it up on the last day. In other words, uh, maybe think of something like a Lego temple. Um, only instead of being made out of a few hundred blocks, imagine it's made up of trillions of blocks. And Jesus says, God gave me that temple, and it's his will that I lose not one of those trillion blocks that make up that temple. So he gave me the temple. There's a number of bricks in that temple, and this is God's will that I not lose one of those bricks, but raise up the whole temple. So that's the first part of this, that the the whole thing he has given me, I'll raise it up on that day. And then he continues, for this is the will of him, uh, of my father, that every single person, every single individual. So the, the first statement is about this whole temple that he's going to raise up. And then how do you know if you're a brick? Well, the brick is that everyone who looks on the sun and believes in him, that person gets eternal life. That's God's will. So this passage is saying, okay, there's a number of people given to um, uh, Jesus by God, and what makes up that number? It's the people who look to the Son and believe in Him. If you look to the Son and believe in Him, uh, you will have eternal life. And Jesus says this, I will raise that person up on the last day. In other words, there isn't going to be anyone in heaven who says, I truly believed. Uh, I received Jesus as he was offered to be in the gospel, and then I'm in hell. There's going to be uh, n no one who can say that. There are going to be a lot of people who say, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not perform miracles in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? And notice what Jesus says, he says, Depart from me, you who constantly work evil. And he says, I never knew you. He doesn't say, I knew you, and then you sinned so bad that I threw you out. He says, I never knew you. So the issue is, is my belief, uh, Lord, Lord, did we not? Or is my belief coming to <laughs> Jesus with a spirit of spiritual bankruptcy? Which one is it? And I really appreciate a, a wise minister who pointed this out to me. What are the Lord, Lord people trusting in? Lord, Lord... What do they say? Did we not? Didn't I preach really good sermons? Didn't I volunteer for the nursery? Didn't I give a lot of money? Didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? Didn't I do the other thing? The people who say that are trusting in their own good works, just like Cain wanted God to accept him based on the work of his hands. True faith is coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, if you judge me based on my works, I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to be a did I not Christian. I want to be a real Christian and real Christians say, look what Jesus did. Look at the perfect life Jesus lived. Look at Jesus' sacrifice when he died for my sins. You gave him this cosmic temple with trillions of people. In fact, you said that the number of those people are like the stars in the heavens. I can only see about a thousand, but you knew there were trillions there. And you said every single one of them has a name. And one of those names was my name. And Jesus said this was the will that every single one of those names I raise up. And so those trillions of people who are going to look in helplessness to Jesus and are saying, if you judge me based on what I do, I'm going to go to hell. If you, 
If you need me to per be perfect, I'm going to go to hell because just like Paul, I say, in my flesh dwells no good thing. Just like Paul, I say, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And Jesus says, if you ever call on the name of the Lord Jesus like that, if you ever come wanting God to be your boss and Jesus to be your Savior, if you ever do that, then that makes you part of that number given to him and I will raise you up in the last day. If my eternal security depends on me, as some well-meaning Christian teachers teach, if it depends on me, I'm going to go to hell because I know what I'm like. I know what my flesh is like. I know what my uh, weak spirit is like. It de if it depends on me, I will end up in hell. But this passage says it doesn't depend on me. It depends on Jesus. And that's why I'm looking to Jesus. This is the will, and I will raise him up. And then we have this verse, which is a really interesting verse. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is the word draw him. And in Greek, it's this word helkuo. No one is able to come to me unless the Father helkuos him. Uh, and if the Father helkuos him, I will raise him up in the last day. That's what Jesus says. So what does the word helkuo mean? Does it mean like you're, you're saying, please come, please come, please come, or is it something different? Well, let's look at where Helkuo appears elsewhere. And if we do, Helkuo um, appears in 1810. Uh, Simon Peter, having Helkuoed his sword out of its sheath, uh, struck the servant of the high priest. So what is Helkuo? Helkuo is grabbing something and pulling it, right? Or even a more stark verse, uh, uh, when the owners saw that uh, their hope of gain was gone. They helkuoed uh, Paul and Silas. Sorry, they seized Paul and Silas, Epilombano, and they helkuoed them into the marketplace. Well, were they saying, Paul and Silas, come here? Or did they grab the back of their neck and drag them, uh, kicking and screaming, uh, knowing that they're going to be beaten? Jesus is saying, Nobody comes to me unless the Father helkuos him. Well, that's kind of weird. That's like unless the Father grabs him. It's like you're stepping out in front of a dump truck and you're looking the wrong way and Jesus like pulls you back. Uh no one will come unless the Father helkuos them. Uh, 665, he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by God. Remember how we started and we were wrestling with that verse, you know, is it us responding or is it God? And, and we saw in that one verse it's us responding and God. Well, this is highlighting that God part again. We have to respond to be saved. You can't be saved if you don't believe. But this verse is emphasizing that second part that we're not born of the will of the flesh or born of the will of man, but we are having been begotten by God. I mean, that sounds that sounds a lot more sovereign grace. Uh, uh, and even... The idea of being born again. I mean, did you sit down with your mom and dad and agree, you know, when you were going to be born and whether you would be a boy or a girl? Or you remember that conversation you had with your parents? Yeah, I don't remember that e either because I wasn't a party to that. Like they decided something and, and I got born. And this is talking about being born again from God. It's like, well, uh, that that kind of sees sovereign uh, grace part. And Jesus, just like in one, couples that with 
responding. You have to respond. It's 100% God and it's 100% you. Uh, I heard one man say it this way, the ball's in your court. Uh, If you uh, don't respond, you're going to prove that you're uh, resisting God. And if you do respond, you're going to prove that God is doing something in your heart. So ball's in your court. Respond. Uh, If you respond, you have it on the authority of Jesus that you will be saved. So can you be eternally secure? Absolutely. But it depends on God, not us. Jesus is the bread of life, just like the manna came down. Jesus came down. Uh, It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. What a great verse. Um, All right, so that's what I have for you today. I hope.